Dear colleague, I'm going to present data on HMO and the preterm infant re clinical relevance. First, I'd like to disclose that this presentation was funded and an honorarium received from Nestle. In term born infants, the total number of bacteria is about the same as the total number of human cells. These bacteria may be divided into beneficial bacteria with a positive effect on functions in the body, neutral type bacteria, or harmful bacteria. The mostly represented beneficial bacteria in term born infants is bifidobacteria. But what about premature infants? We don't really know what would be the most beneficial bacteria in these infants. We don't know either whether microbiota and morbidity may be related in premature infants. In the EpiPage 2 national cohort study in 2011, we evaluated 3,161 premature infants, their gestational age ranged between 24 to 41 weeks. In this cohort, 106 infants presented with necrotizing enterocolitis over a stage two of Bell. The infants had a higher risk of NEC in case they had a slower rate of feeding or less breastfeeding. In a subset of 94 cases, we were able to evaluate microbiota. Indeed, we showed that microbiome was associated with NEC. As you can see on this graph, we have the NEC cases in black and the controls in gray. The infants most colonized with Clostridium were most likely to present with necrotizing enterocolitis in this study. Interestingly, the infants colonized mostly by bifidobacterium did not present any NEC. In the EpiFlor study, 577 infants from the EpiPage 2 with stool analysis at one month of age were followed up to two years postnatal age. The gut microbiota was grouped into six clusters in the study, one cluster being not amplifiable because of too low bacterial load. Then we have five other clusters. The first one mostly represented with Oterobacter, the second one mostly represented by Clostridium, the third one by Escherichia coli Shigella, the fourth one by Citrobacter, and finally, the fifth one by Staphylococcus. In this study, we showed that gut microbiota was associated with NICU practices and two years clinical outcome. First thing, we demonstrated that cluster four and five was significantly from infants younger than cluster three that came from more mature infants. And that was taken as a reference for that reason. When we compared the different clusters, we observed that for late one sepsis, skin to skin within the first week of life or breastfeeding within the first week of life, the more mature cluster was significantly different from the enterococcus, staphylococcus, or no bacteria cluster for all of these parameters. When we looked at the two-year outcome with a criteria of evaluation that was DEF or neurodevelopment assessment with age and stage questionnaire below 185, again, we observed a significant and important difference between the infants who had a more mature cluster at birth, rather at one month of age, sorry, rather than enterococcus, staphylococcus, or no bacteria. Then we would like to modulate microbiota. Besides maturation of the infants, microbiota may be influenced by prebiotics. Among them, HMO, such as 2 fucosylactose have been demonstrated to beneficially influence microbiota. Human milk oligosaccharides represent up to 25% of human milk carbohydrates. They are indigestible for the stomach and the intestinal tract. They are represented from five elementary units, such as glucose, galactose, and acetylglucosalamide, fucose or sialic acid. 
they are made of a core of lacto and bios, where is branch a unit of lactose and either a unit of fucose or silic acid. HMO are not only prebiotics. They have been shown to also have direct antimicrobial property. They may have anti-adhesive poss possibility. They may be epithelial cell modulators or even immune cell modulators. This slide show the association between microbiota and HMO. In this study, Corpola et al. Com compared the microbiota of infants born by vaginal delivery or by cesarean section. They also compare in these infants those who received HMO in their mother's milk, either when they were born vaginally or by cesarean section. The authors showed that there was no difference whether the infants received or not HMO in their mother's milk when they were born by vaginal delivery. On the contrary, there were a significant difference in favor of the infants who received HMO in their milk when they were born by caesarean section. Overall, the authors concluded that two fucosilactose HMO in mother's milk may alleviate the effects of caesarean birth on infant goat microbiota. That study was performed in term-born infants. HMO content in human milk may be very viable. This may be due because of maternal genetics. It has been shown that the mothers may have a secretor profile for specific HMO, such as 2 fucosilactose or a non-secretor profile. Likewise, that has been shown that there is a significant difference when the mother delivered privately free with less 2 fucosilactose in their milk than when they were born at term, and that lasted for three weeks. In 63 different mothers, Gabrielli and Colid confirmed that there was some secretor mother and some mothers with non-secretor profile. They showed that uh, for specific HMO, there may be some non-detected HMO in the milk or eye level. And they also demonstrated that again for specific HMO, there may be a significant difference between the rates of the HMO in the colostrum or in more mature milk. Of note, that was really seen for specific HMO, but not all of them. Moreau and colleague showed that there may be an increased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and late one cell sepsis in 410 neonates with a gestational age of 28 weeks, ranging from 23 to 32, and in this cohort, one third of the infants had mother with a 2 fucosilactose low secretor phenotype. The authors observed 26 dead. 15% were from the low secretor group versus 2% in the high secretor group, and that was statistically significant. 22% of the infants presented with necrotizing enterocolitis versus 7% in the low secret in the high secretor group, that was significant. And again, gram-negative late one cell sepsis was higher in the low secretor group rather versus the high secretor group. In this study, Maisie and colleague showed that the low level of specific HMO may be associated with NEC. They performed an HMO profiling in mother's own milk in infants with NEC versus controls. They showed that the level of a single HMO that was here, this DSLNT, was significantly lower in mother's own milk received by infants with NEC. They calculated a fresh old level of 241 nanomoles per liter, as you may see on this slide, with a sensitivity and specificity of 0.9 for NEC. When they performed a microbiome analysis, they showed that there was a lower bifidobacteria and higher enterobacter cloacae relative abundance 
associated with DSNNT 11. Finally, Moro and colleague again showed that HMO may be associated with a protection against diarrhea in breastfed infants. In this study of 93 breastfeeding mother infant pairs studied from birth up to two years postnatal age, they evaluated milk samples obtained from one to five weeks postpartum. They divided their population into low, intermediate, and high levels defined by the first, second, or third tercile of the population. They showed that regarding the level of 2-fucosylactone in milk, there was a significant risk of Campylobacter diarrhea when this level was too low as compared when it was intermediate or high. When looking at the whole fucosyl oligosaccharides in milk, again, they observed a significant higher risk of severe diarrhea with low level as compared to intermediate or high level. Well, all these studies raise the question on may HMO supplementation have a benefit on microbiota and beyond in premise. Clinical safety and efficacy data are required in order to address that question. This is why we performed an intervention study on the effect of a liquid supplement containing two HMO in preterm infants. The goal of this study was to demonstrate feeding tolerance among preterm infants measured by non-inferiority in days to reach full enteral feeding in the HMO versus the placebo group. Shorter time to reach full enteral feeding would be an indication of adequate gastrointestinal tolerance and helps to provide sufficient nutrition to assure growth and impact the outcome. Secondary outcome would be growth parameters, gastrointestinal symptoms, adverse events up to 12 months corrected age, fetal microbiota, gut maturation, and breastfeeding HMO composition. Here is the protocol of a study. The design was a prospective, randomized, double-blind control trial in 27 to 33 weeks gestation infants in French centers. Early administration after 24-hour feeding was advised, and in any case, before seven days postnatal age. As you can see here, when the infants had 24 hours of trophic feeding, they started the product and was this period of pre-full enteral feeding. Then, when full enteral feeding was reached, an evaluation was done every week up to discharge. Both enteral feeding volume above 150 mils per kilo per day and parenteral nutrition discontinuation was needed to define full enteral feeding. The product is a colorless and odorless solution of 260 milliosmol per kilo concentration of, one, of 0 0.1 gram per milliliter. It is composed of a mixture of two fucosylactose and LLNT ratio uh, LLNT on a ratio of 10 over 1 and a dosing of 0.125 given three times a day as it reflects breast milk composition. It is given before gavage or feeding when the infant is mature enough for sucking. The results. In black, the results of the HMO group. In blue, the placebo group. There was no difference in this study between the two groups for gestational age in weeks, the rate of very low birth weight infants or extremely low birth weight infants. There was no difference either for weight for HZ score, length for HZ score, head circumferency for HZ score at birth. There was no difference for the rate of small for gestational age infants. The sex distribution was even. There was no difference for cesarean section. And the postnatal age of the first product administration was identical in the two groups. About the exposure to intervention and milk feeding, there was no difference with the two groups, again, the HMO group in black and the placebo group in blue. The treatment duration, the pre-full enteral feeding period was not different between the two groups. The duration of treatment during the full enteral feeding period was not different between the two groups either. 
There was no difference for don donor human milk uh, and mother's own milk between the two groups before or during the full anterior period. Prevalence of formula feeding increased through the full anterior period feeding in the same amount in the two groups. Primary tolerance outcome. The non-inferiority of time to reach full enteral feeding was achieved in this study. In addition, when we looked at the adjusted mean time to reach full enteral feeding, there was two days shorter in favor of the HMO group, but this was not significant as the study was not powered for that. Looking at growth and short-term outcome, when we look at the weight for age Z-score evolution, you have in red the HMO group, in blue the placebo group. As you can see here, there was no significant difference throughout the study for the weight for age Z-score. But when looking over at the head circumferency for age Z-score, which has exactly the same profile at the length for age Z-score, we observed that there was no difference throughout the study, but as discharge, we have moderate the significant benefit in favor of the HMO group for head circumferency for HZ score and length, length for HZ score. There was no difference between the two groups for morbidity. We observed low average gastric residuals ranging from zero to three meals per kilo per day. The mean stool frequency was around three to four stools per day. We observed three NEC in the HMO group versus two in the control group, no late one sepsis in the HMO group and two in the control group, and that was not significant for either of these uh, indicators. One abdominal distension versus four were observed with diarrhea in placebo, and one versus two adverse event caused product discontinuation. None of these parameters was significant between the two groups. So in summary, we may say that the primary endpoint of tolerance, non-inferiority in time to reach full enteral feeding was achieved in that study. In addition, we had a trend toward a reduced time to achieve full enteral feeding of two days, but we, this was not significant. Weight gain was similar, at circumferency and length was slightly greater and discharge in the HMO group. So, we may suggest that HMO supplement may support improved early postnatal growth. Finally, comparable outcome of gastrointestinal symptoms and gastrointestinal adverse events were not different between the, the two groups, allowing us to conclude that HMO supplementation is safe and well related in that population. So in conclusion, in premature infants, gut microbiota may show different patterns correlated with NICU practices and immaturity and may be associated with morbidity and clinical outcome. Microbiota appears to be associated with HMOs in premies and specific HMOs milk content may be associated with short-term clinical outcomes such as neck, late one sepsis or even death and long-term outcomes such as diarrhea or neurodevelopment. HMO supplementation given as soon as possible after birth is safe and well related. It supports age-appropriate growth in weight and is consistent with length and head circumferency improved early postnatal growth. I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank the core investigators of the study I just presented to you. Thank you very much.